morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Doing well? Dave's just a ray of sunshine in this building, isn't he? We're so grateful for Dave. Well, let's all stand, and we're going to sing some, some songs to the Lord and just have a time of worship, um, as we do. So let's pray, and um, yeah. Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for, God, your hand just moving in and through our lives, and God, even in the things we don't even realize, God, the things we take for granted or God, hindsight just reveals to us, God, you were there, you were carrying us, you were um, just in and through the whole time. So, Lord, we thank you today. I uh, ask that you would bless this service. Lord, let your love just shine in this building. Let it shine through your people today. And um, just speak mightily, just with power and authority through will as he shares your word. God, we are so blessed to have your word uninhibited, God, unrestrained unrestricted in this place, God. So we thank you for that, and we thank you for everything um, you provide for us. Lord, we, we love you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Open up my eyes and walk. 
has never failed me. Christ before me, Christ behind me. Amen. Those words are just so beautiful. Christ is, he goes before us and he's been there behind us. He's been with us the whole way through. So we'd like to invite our elder up to pray over the offering norm. Morning, everybody. George, it's so good to see you back. And, and April. <laughs> this morning, I'm reading from Matthew, chapter 5, verse 43, 44. God's, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son, S-U-N, rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So, Father God, we need to remember those words, uh, the times that are going on now in our country and in our world. Uh, we just have to love everyone and uh, never forget what Jesus teaches us. In, Je in his name, amen.
to us, Lord, the life that we have because of you. God, we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Okay, so our announcements. Um, basically, they're pretty short. Wednesday night Bible study, please come join us as we uh, continue our study through the book of Ezekiel. I got to tell you, I, you know, I've, I've read through Ezekiel before. I know I have because I have notes. But I am learning so much, so much more than I ever did. And um, I guess that number one comes by having to prepare a study for it, you know, so I actually have to do a little more uh, diligence there. But it is amazing the depth and the width of what the Lord is, is bringing to us. Yeah, there's a lot of prophetic scripture in there. We're, we're coming into chapters 33 and on, and it's all about the restoration of Israel and, and what God is going to do in, in the last days and all of that. But, but it, is, it is a very deep study. So come join us on Wednesday nights at 6.30. Uh, this Friday, January 29th, 6.30 to 9, is the Anchored Youth Game Night. And so uh, this is for, for the youth. They, they told me, Will, you're not invited. I mean, literally, that's what my wife said. She said, you don't get to go. Yeah, I know. I said the same thing. Oh. I, no, they won't let me play at all, George. Anyway, so ages 7th through 12th grade. So, yeah, I do not qualify. But uh, so you teenagers out there. And, and uh, middle schoolers, if you have friends, invite them to come and join the youth uh, and, and have a game night there. Um, I also have got this other announcement. Um, oops. 
who's on our door this morning, Kane County COVID-19. I thought it said vacation sign up, but no, it's vaccination sign up. So, and, and it says sign up to call. So write this down, 435-644-4994. And um, I guess it's to schedule your vaccination. And so I don't know what the criteria is for the vaccination. I'm, I'm guessing they do have a criteria uh, by age or whatever it may be. And so uh, if you would like that, we're, we'll post this out there and it'll be available uh, for you to sign up. Um, I now have another announcement. So I was contacted by an elderly couple. Uh, They're in, in desperate need. They can't make their rent this month. And um, I would just ask you if, if the Lord wants to put it on your heart to help them. They need $700 to pay their rent. And so um, if you would like to give to that, just come and speak to me and, and um, we'll put that together. You know, everybody's having hard times, right? A lot of folks that just really didn't prepare for this, didn't just blindsided them. And, and so if you would like to help in that, um, uh, please come and talk to me and, and we'll see what we can do for them. Okay. Um, all right, let's, let's just pray and then we'll get into God's word. Father, thank you, Lord, so much for the body of Christ. Lord, thank you so much for the, the eternal life that's been given to us through the gift of God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, Lord. You've given us a, a, an abundant life, Lord, more than we ever could have anticipated. Lord, thank you for the body of Christ, that we can come together as the hands and feet and the eyes and ears uh, of, of, of Jesus, Lord, here on this earth to accomplish the things that you would desire for us, Lord. Thank you for just the gift of worship, the gift of your word, the gift of fellowship, the gift of communion that we get to experience with you, Lord. You've given us so much. Lord, it says your, your word says that uh, you use all things for the good of those called, Lord, according to your purposes, Lord, those who love you. And so we will look at that in your word today. And, and Father, just we ask for your spirit, Lord, a fresh filling, a fresh empowerment of your spirit, Lord, in our lives. Uh, Lord, that we would just accomplish the will of God in our lives, Lord. We thank you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So have you ever gone through life and, and all of a sudden you, you find yourself in a place that you never thought you'd be? You find yourself doing things that you thought, I'm not equipped to do this. I, this is so far beyond me. Or you find yourself in situations you're like, oh my gosh, this is so scary. This could actually be a detriment to my life, to my safety, to, my, to the things I actually uh, want to do with my life. It's, I'm just, I feel like I've just gone way off course. Or you wake up one morning and God spoke to you and you said, Lord, you're asking me to do something that is so far beyond me. How could you even think to ask me of that? Well, that was Joseph and Mary, wasn't it? You know, one, one, one day Joseph's just sitting there and an angel appears to himself and, and, and says, hey, you're going to have a son by Mary, and you're going to call his name Jesus, and you're going to, and he will save people from his from their sins. Or, or, if that isn't big enough, poor Mary, right? All of a sudden, God appears to her and says, "Hey, Mary, you're going to be with child by the Holy Spirit." And she's like, "Well, I'm just a young teenage girl. I haven't even, I, you know, I'm betrothed to this guy Joseph. He's a knucklehead." But, you know, he's going to be my husband. But other than that, I really don't have a lot of plans for my life. And now you tell me I'm going to bear this child. You know, what it is, is it's the providence of God in our lives. It's not karma. It's not situations. It's not circumstances. It's actually God moving in our lives. And I, you know, I can look in my life, looking back, and realizing the things that I thought were horrible going on in my life, 
Um, I'll, I'll just give you a good example. I, I got divorced. And, and it was terrible. It was, it was horrible, folks. Let me tell you, it's horrible. And, and, but I can look back now and realize it was actually God used it to take me places I would have never gone on my own and to do things with me that I would have never done on my own. Never. It was never on my horizon to do those things. And, and we're going to look at that in chapter 2, and it is amazing to me as I, as I looked at this, just how many people God used to fulfill Scripture, right? You know, because Matthew, the book of Matthew, was written to a Jewish audience, and, and the major theme in it is that it might be fulfilled, that it was written, that it was fulfilled, and what he's trying to get across to the Jewish people is that this whole Old Testament that we study and, and they, they love is actually about Jesus. And it's to bring them to a knowledge and an understanding that Jesus was the fulfillment of those old scriptures and that he is the Messiah. He is the Lord's Christ, the anointed one of God. And that was his desire for the Jewish people, and I think it's his desire for us today, is that we would come to that knowledge as well, and we would understand it. And so, we'll begin in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men uh, from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. Okay, so let's just kind of dissect this a little bit. It says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. How did Jesus get to Bethlehem to be born? You remember? In Luke chapter 2, it says some guy by the name of Quirinius, or however you pronounce it, called for a census, and everybody had to go back to their own birthplace to be counted. So that would be if the call went out to us today, I would have to go back to Tucumcari, New Mexico. I would have to travel all the way there to be counted. That's where my father lived. That's where our family lived. Well, that happened. So Joseph and Mary, right, were in Nazareth, and she was well on her way to, to birthing this child that she'd been given by God. The call came out, and so Joseph and Mary had to pack up and go to Bethlehem. And it says now that time came for her, uh, you know, in, in, in Luke it says it was fulfilled, the time of her birth. And, and so Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Well, now, we'll, we'll see it actually in, in, in verse 5 there. It says, but, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, you know, uh, are not least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Uh, for thus it was written. It was written by Micah, a prophet, 400 and plus some years before that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. So God used this governor by the name of Quirinius to call for a census that would force Joseph and Mary to go to Bethlehem. Yeah, they didn't have a choice, folks. They had to go. And so that's how they ended up in Bethlehem. It's the providence of God. God using, I'm pretty sure that Joseph had no idea that he was going to go to Bethlehem to fulfill the scripture of Micah. Pretty sure he wasn't thinking about that at all. You know what he's thinking about? Oh my gosh, I hope they don't stone us next week. I'm pretty sure they were suffering ridicule and harassment by everybody in Nazareth because this young girl is pregnant out of wedlock and Joseph is her husband. It isn't like today's culture, folks, where we all just kind of brush it aside and, and we have baby showers and, and we just... No, it wasn't that way. It's still not that way in that culture. It's a shameful thing, the situation that they were in. So here they are. Next thing you know, they were, they were called to go to Bethlehem, and they were there, and Jesus was born, and he fulfilled the scripture of Micah, chapter 
5, verse 2. But also, not only that, but it says, In the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men from the east came. And so let's just do an overview of Herod. You know who Herod is, right? Herod the Great. He was governor over, over Judea at the time. Herod was actually an Edomite. He was of the, the, the lineage of Esau. He was a son of, of, born from Esau, right? Esau and Jacob. He was an Edomite. And so uh, the, the problem with him being an Edomite was um, the Edomites actually became enemies of the Jewish people. So here he is ruling over the Jewish people that are underneath him, and they don't like him. He actually wants to be accepted by the people. Herod had a big insecurity complex. He was a narcissist. He, he just, and he would force people to love him. <laughs> if you don't love me, I will kill you. But not only that, but he, but he had this other side of his personality, which God had granted him this, this gift of engineering and architectural design. And so he went all over the country, and he built these huge monuments to his ego. He built the Herodian, which was his burial place. They found it, unearthed it. I've been there. It's an amazing structure. It's this big round castle thing built on a hill. He actually buried it. He actually buried it so nobody would know he was there. Anyway, that weird thing. He built Masada. Have you guys ever heard of Masada? This great fortress set on a hill, a mountaintop actually overlooking the Dead Sea. And it was a... It was a fortress because he felt he was going to need to flee and hide from all the rebellious people that hated him. And so he built this fortress, and it was stocked up with enough food and water that he could live up there for years and years. It had a swimming pool. It had a library. It had hot pools and tubs and saunas. And I've been there. It's an amazing story. He never spent one day there. He built Caesarea Maritime, a, a port in, off the Mediterranean, and, and where he could. And there's this huge amphitheater there, and, and race tracks, and all this just amazing aqueduct that came from seven miles away to bring in fresh water. Still standing, could, it would still work today if they would dig it out and, and open the gate. And not only that, but maybe one of his greatest achievements was, was remodeling the temple in Jerusalem. You know, it was the second temple. We would call it uh, Hezekiah's temple or, or Zerubbabel's temple rebuilt. It was the second. But he, he took it and made it one of the seven wonders of the world, folks. This thing was 15 stories tall. It was magnificent. The courtyards. He leveled out 11 acres of ground on a mountaintop built retaining walls 40 feet tall in order to just level out the ground so he could just make this magnificent. And what he was, his hope was that the Jewish people would love him. No, they, they hated him because he's an Edomite. So there's King Herod. Okay, and We're going to see how God will actually use him as well uh, to fulfill his word. But then we also have these wise men from the east came and, and, and they were moved by a star. A star appeared in the heavens. They were in the east looking west and they were actually, uh, they call them magi. Some of your, your Bibles might say magi or magicians. Well, actually they were astronomers. They studied the heavens, the, the skies, the night skies. And because for some reason, they knew about a prophecy of a Messiah, a king of the Jews that was to come, and it was to be declared in the heavens. Uh, the, the prophecy said that, that, that the heavens would declare the birth of this Messiah, this king of the Jews. And so they're in the east, looking into the heavens, awaiting this sign. We would call those people, you're crazy as a loon. No, they knew something. They knew something that other people didn't. And they were paying attention, and they were waiting, and they were watching, right? And so these wise men, um, a lot of people uh, believe that maybe these people were, were descendants of Daniel. 
You know, Daniel was one, one of the wisest guys, and, and he was in exile in the east in Babylon, served Nebuchadnezzar and all that. If you've been with us on Wednesdays, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And, and yet, so there he was, the wisest. And Daniel knew he was a pretty smart guy. So a lot of commentators believe that maybe they were descendants of Daniel. I, I'm, I got a different idea. I think they were descendants of Abraham through his second wife, Keturah. Do you know that Abraham had a second wife after Sarah passed away? He remarried again. He married a little gal by the name of Keturah. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 25. Let's go way back in our Bibles. Genesis chapter 25. There's some interesting things I want us to see here. Genesis chapter 25, verses, uh, let's see, 1 through 13, we're going to read. It says, Abraham again took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And she bore to him Zimram, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, remember Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan, we got that guy, we got that, and, and he goes down, verse 4. And the sons of Midian were Ephah, Ephah, Hanuk, Abadiah, and Elda, and all these were the children of Keturah, okay? And Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. Remember, Isaac was the child of the promise through Sarah. But Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward. Abraham had these these other sons by Keturah, and he sent them east. He gave them gifts, and he sent them eastward, away from Isaac, his son, to the country of the east. Okay? And now uh, we're going to jump down to verse uh, 13. Actually, verse 12. Now this is the genealogy of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's maidservant, bore to Abraham. And of these were the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names, according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael was Nebath, and then Kedar, Abel, and Mishim. So Abraham had these other children, right, by these other women, and he was not willing to share the promise of the inheritance of God that was given to Isaac with these other kids. And so you remember Ishmael, the, the daughter of or the son of, um, of Hagar, his handmaid, right? He actually blessed him and sent him off to the east. And we know that uh, Arab nations came through the line of Ishmael. The Arab nations that we see today, they're the descendants of Ishmael. They're Ishmaelites. They're all, and they went to the land of Kedar. Actually, we see that in the Bible as well, because one of the sons' name was Kedar. Land of Kedar. Actually, that land of Kedar is actually Saudi Arabia today. The land of Kedar. Okay. So we got Keturah here and the sons for there. Now let's turn to Isaiah chapter 60. Oops. I'm in Matthew. Isaiah chapter 60. There's a prophecy in here about some guys. In Isaiah chapter 60, it says this. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, the deep darkness, uh, the people, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light and the kings of, to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They are all gathered together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. A multitude of, multitude of camels shall cover your land, the dromedaries of who? Midian, one of the sons of Keturah. 
and of Ephah. And those from Sheba shall come. Sheba is Arabia. And they shall bring gold and incense. Is any of this ringing bells here? And they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord, and the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you. I believe that these guys, these wise men, are actually the descendants of Abraham and Keturah. I believe they were. It fits the criteria of God's word. And they would come. When the light would arise, the star would shine above, and it would cause them to come. And they would, okay, we got to deal with some concepts of, of modern Christianity. It, it just, it just is crazy stuff, but. You remember we, we had the little nativity scene out here and we see them all the time and it shows the star and the, 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 the stable and, and we see the wise men and the little baby Jesus and all this. We have three wise men, number one. We, the Bible never says that. We have no idea. We know there was more than, than one. There was at least two because they're wise men, plural, but then where we got three, I don't know. Maybe because of the three gifts. But we're going to see that, that that whole scene is totally unbiblical. It really is. I just really have a problem with the, the nativity scenes. It's, it's really unbiblical. It doesn't jive with scripture at all. And we'll see that. We'll look at this. But here we have these wise men. They came from the east. Now, these caravans, we have to understand, too, these guys... When they were back in the east, when they first saw the star, if the star appeared at the time that Jesus was born, that means that star had to sit there for quite a while for them to make at least the six-month journey into Jerusalem. Now, if you're going to make a six-month journey by camel, are you going to just pack up and leave that day? No, it's going to take a lot of planning. You're going to have to gather food and rations and make, what, right? It's going to take a long time to put that together to make that six-month journey. So we don't know exactly the day that the star appeared. I'm just going to throw that out. We'll talk more about the star a little bit later. But we do know that something moved in these men's lives that caused them to start packing for a six-month journey. It's the providence of God. God uses the heavens to even move in the lives of these guys that are living in the east, just watching the stars. All of a sudden, one day, there it is. And they're like, oh my gosh. Time to start packing. Let's go. And so there it is. And we see that moving in them. And it says they, they came from the east to Jerusalem and, and saying, where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and we have come to worship him. We have come to worship him. So they go to Jerusalem, of course, because they're going to go to the king, King Herod. And, and then they say, where is he who was born King of the Jews. Now, if you know anything about Herod, you know that that right there would have just unnerved him to no end because he's very insecure. He killed all of his rivals, even his own sons. Herod killed his own sons because he thought they might usurp him. Uh, the, the emperor Claudius, I think was the time, said it was better to be a pig in Herod's house than one of his own sons. It was safer to be a pig in Herod's house than to be one of his sons. Anyway, that's so they, these, these wise men show up one day and they, they get an audience with the king. I tell you, this, this tells us something else. Not everybody could just get an audience with King Herod. When these guys pulled in, they had to be prominent people that they could walk up and, and get an audience with King Herod. And they did. And they said, we've come to worship him. Where am he? And, and now let's see. Let's just move on. Verses 3 and, and, and 4. It says, and, and when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. 
and all of Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered the chief priests and scribes and the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, Well, in Bethlehem, in Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So Herod goes, okay, these guys are asking for the king of the Jews. And he gathers together. He's like, well, who would know? Who would know where this this child is to be born? Well, the priests and the scribes, the religious leaders of the day, they should know, right? And so they they pop up and they say, well, I I think it's supposed to be Bethlehem. What do you got? And they're like, yeah, I think it was written in Micah. Yeah, let's. Shouldn't they have known? If anybody, shouldn't the religious leaders who studied God's word know to watch and pray and to see the signs? And yet they didn't. Totally missed it. Then Herod, verse 7, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. See, Herod's, his little wheels are spinning now. He's like, oh, all right. I've got to deal with this king of the Jews. So he secretly calls the wise men to him and, and begins to question them about how long ago. When did you see the star? How long did it take you to get here? So probably would have been maybe six months, maybe even up to a year ago that that child might have been born. Hmm, okay. And so then he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, Bring back word to me that that I may come and worship him also. And so here he is. Herod's a, he is a sneaky guy. He's conniving. He's smart. He's intelligent. And he's like, hey, I'm with you guys. I'm one of you. I want to worship him too. I got to tell you something. The enemies of God will try to look just like you. And they will say, oh, I want to worship the one true and living God as well. Let me get in amongst you. Let me be part of what you're doing. Oh, yeah, let me. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. Their desire is to destroy us from within. And they will appear to be light. And they will appear to do will appear to be believers and followers of Jesus, but their actions will absolutely prove contrary to the Bible and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I can tell you just one point that all you need to look at, the sanctity of life. If you call yourself a Christian and you support abortion, you are absolutely on the wrong side of the fence. Just throw it out there. That's not what we're talking about today, though. <laughs> the providence of God. So God is using, he's using King Herod. Do you see that? He's using King Herod in, in the lives of these wives and men as well to get them where they need to go. But he has alternative uh, designs for the Christ child. He doesn't seek to worship him. He, he, we know he seeks to kill him. So he sent them secretly and, and bring back word that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed. Behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. This star is moving in ways that stars don't normally behave. Okay, now we can talk about, well, maybe it was a meteor. Maybe it was this, that, or the other. Um, I'm going to, have you guys ever heard of the, the, the film called The Star of Bethlehem? It was written and produced and, and, and by a guy. It, it's actually a documentary. It, um, what's his name again? Uh, Frederick Larson. Frederick Larson. I recommend you watch this. He was a lawyer. And, and he looked at the, the nine points that were made about the Star of Bethlehem. And being a lawyer with the mind that he had, he... He wanted to see how this could be. And so he took those nine points 
and he began looking at them in scripture and trying to figure out what this cosmic phenomenon could actually be. And then he had such wonderful, we have this wonderful technology now that you can pick any date in history and go back and from any place in the world and look at the heavens. And so he began doing that. He had a time frame to look at, right? Because we know that, that Herod lived between 72 B.C. and 4 B.C. And so we know that somewhere between 4 B.C., Christ child was born. And so he began looking at the heavens and how this star reacted, what it did, and he started searching the heavens using this computer program. I would highly recommend you, you just, you can go probably on YouTube and watch it on YouTube. The Star of Bethlehem. It's amazing. Um, maybe on one Wednesday night we'll, we'll show it. It's pretty, pretty astounding. So anyway, this, this, this star moved and then it stopped. And it stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So here it is. Now we have this picture. Now no longer it says, did they come to the stable? No, they came to the house where the infant was. No, where the young child was. You see, this picture of the nativity, I, I really struggle with it, you know, and I just, I want them to throw it out because it's unbiblical. No, it needs to be a house with a two-year-old or a one-year-old or a young child. They showed up, they didn't see a baby lying in a manger. They show, showed a little toddler running around the house, snot-nosed, touching everything, you know, sticky. He's a young child. They're no longer in the house. So they've been in Bethlehem for a while. They've been there for a while. And, and so here they are. Now these guys show up, and we don't know. I suspect it was a large gathering of people. I suspect it was probably... 20 or 30 people. You know, when these guys would travel, these, these caravans, they, oftentimes they brought a lot of their family with them. But these were prominent men. We know that by, by number one, they got an audience with the king. They had the ability to put together and travel. Uh, and, and the gifts that they're bringing are very, very expensive gifts. And so here they are. They're in the house. And and they, they brought these treasures to the Lord. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, that's, that's very valuable, I'm guessing, in ancient Israel at that time, ancient Judea. Frankincense, you know what frankincense was? It was the incense that was burned in the temple. It was actually only allowed by priests to have. Did you know that? The common man was not supposed to have frankincense in his possession. Only the priests were allowed to burn frankincense. And yet here they offered him to this child. What does that say about Jesus? He is our great high priest. This frankincense was very costly. It was made from a, a, a tree. They would cut it and the, the sap would run out and then it would crystallize and they would refine this stuff and make incense out of it. And it was for temple worship. And myrrh is the same thing. Myrrh is another spice. It's an embalming spice. It's used to embalm people, to, to keep them from putrefying is, is what it actually described. It. And it's the same thing. It's taken from a tree, and they take the sap, and it's refined and made into a, and it's very valuable. You'll see that as when, in Jesus' burial. Nebuchadnezzar and, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> oh, my gosh. What was that guy's name that, that came to Jesus at night? Nicodemus, there it is, thank you. And Joseph, and Joseph of Arathema came to embalm Jesus' body, and they brought these costly uh, spices. 
to embalmment, and one of those is myrrh. Do you see the difference in how people reacted to this child being born? The knowledge of this child being born? So, these wise men, the motivation that was in their hearts was to come and, and to bring an offering, a sacrifice, a costly sacrifice, by the way. It wasn't their leftovers. It was something that cost them to, to worship the king with. They gave of their lives, their time, their resources, everything to worship this king. Motivated by the, the prophecy of scripture and the signs in the heaven. The chief priests and scribes, it's just kind of indifferent to them. He's been, the king of the Jews has been born? I didn't even know. Really? It's just kind of indifference. King Herod? Ooh, made him greatly afraid. I'm being threatened by this king of the Jews. He's threatening everything I stand for. I need to get rid of him. I need him out of my life. You know, Paul talked about this in, in uh, the book of Acts. In chapter 17, when he was preaching uh, on Mars Hill, he says, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, well, we'll hear you again on this matter. They were indifferent to it. But however, some men joined him and believed. You know, it's the same. It's, it's the same today. People can hear the gospel, and to a lot of them, it just it's indifference. I've heard it over and over again. It means nothing to me. Some people, it just flat ticks off. They just get so mad. You're so judgmental and so narrow-minded with this Jesus that there's only one way to heaven, and it just makes them mad. And so what do they do? They just dismiss it. Let's just get it out of here. If they could, I would just like to destroy you two and just level your building to the ground so I never have to hear it again. But some hear it and believe, and they follow. This is just a, this is just a child was born. And do you see the, the, the turmoil that was created over this one child in the world? That it, the, the reactions of different, how it causes them to move in their lives? It's an amazing thing. You know, Jesus, is, his birth just shook heavens and earth. Just his birth, just coming into the world, changed people's lives. I found that... Kids are born all the... How many kids are going to be born today? It may impact a, a few people here and there. But to shake governments and religious systems and people from far away, something's going on here. But they fell down and they worshipped him and they gave offerings to him. You know, we see those same offerings. Did you see that in, in Isaiah chapter 60, the gifts that they brought? Let's go back there. And it said they would bring, oh, where am I? I've lost it. Oh, my gosh. Oh, there it is, verse 6. Yeah, it says, They will come from Midian and Ephah and their dromedaries and from Sheba. They shall bring gold and incense. And that's exactly what these guys brought, right? They came from the east bringing gold and incense as gifts to the Christ child. Okay. So then what happens? In verse 12, Then, then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. So contrary to the, to the promptings of this King Herod to come and tell him about the Christ child, God intervenes and says, no, secretly get out of town. Don't tell anybody where you're going and leave another way. Don't go back through Jerusalem. I can't help but think, 
you know, even if I had, let's just say, five camels. Bethlehem is a city of about 2,000 people at the most during this time. It's going to be pretty noticeable. A guy in the middle of the day marching out of town with his five camels. People are going to notice that. But say I had 20. Say I had 100. Say I'm a large company. You're going to be noticed. You're going to head out of Dodge in the middle of the night. And people are sleeping. They're just going to wake up one day and they're going to say, Those, they're gone. Because when Herod shows up, they're going to go, we don't know. They were just here one day and the next they were gone. And so they, they left another way. The Lord spoke to them uh, in a dream. Verse 13, now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. All right, so the wise men are gone, and now Joseph's sitting there, him and Mary, and they look at all this stuff, and they're like, what's going on? The Lord appears to Joseph in a dream, and he says this. He says, arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and he departed to Egypt. And he was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt I have called my son. So once again, the providence of God moving in Joseph's life through a dream, saying, get up right now, take the child, and I want you to move to Fredonia. I don't want to live in Fredonia. Why should I go to Fredonia? It's the last place on my list. For it's written, out of Fredonia, I have called my son. I'm pretty sure that Joseph had no desire to move to Egypt. I'm pretty sure. He'd been in Bethlehem, I suspect, for about two years. I think the timeline's about two years that he and Mary had been in Bethlehem. They went there for the census. She had the baby. you got to remember, this was his hometown. This is where a lot of his family lived. And so, Joseph, I don't know what he did for a living. Carpenter, right? Furniture builder, boat. I don't know why they're building boats in Bethlehem. That don't make sense. But he's a carpenter. And so, I think he started working and providing for his family. And they're just kind of building a life in Bethlehem. And all of a sudden, the Lord says, no, move to Egypt. And Joseph, being a just man and a devout man of God, does it right then and there. He looks at Mary and says, pack up. We're leaving right now. And they left. Do you think Joseph in his mind said, and we're going to fulfill scripture? For I remember it says, out of Egypt I will call my son. I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think he had a clue. He was just doing what the Lord motivated him to do, even though it didn't make any sense at all. Egypt. You know, that represents the world, right? We know that through Scripture. And, and so, but there he goes, obedient to God, and next thing you know, he's, they've moved to Egypt. he also knows that Herod wants to kill this child. You know, God let him in on that. He said he seeks the young child's life. And so he used that to, to motivate Joseph to, to get up and go right now. You know, sometimes there's things in our life. Um, you know, we're, we don't live by a spirit of fear, right? We talked about this, but by a spirit of love. But when God speaks to you, and, and sometimes through situations, circumstances, you need to pay attention and listen. Maybe a scary situation is coming up, is coming around the corner, and God's speaking to you and says, hey, you need to get going. You can't stay here. I had a judge speak that very thing into my life one time. He looked at me as I'm sitting across his desk in my little orange monkey suit. Give you a picture. And he said, Will, you need to move. 
or else we're going to throw you in prison and you're going to do five years. You know what that did? That scared the dickens out of me. And he let me loose and I moved. Because the Lord had been speaking to me too. This was all part of this. And, and God was using circumstances in my life that were totally beyond my control, folks. I, I want to just tell you that. It's totally beyond my control. And God used this man, this judge, to speak into my life and motivate me to get off my keister, pack up, and leave. And it was one of the best things I ever did in my life. God used it. It's what brought me here. Maybe not best thing for you, but it has been for me. The providence of God. Verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, he was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem in all its districts from two years old and under. So we, we have a timeline there. And, and he says, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. So Herod knew that this Christ child could be as old as two, but he could be younger as well. So he says, kill them all. And he, and he says, then it was fulfilled, which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. Once again, the fulfillment of scripture, even horrible things such as this, was prophesied by and was fulfilled in and through the providence in King Herod's life. This horrible, wicked man. And it says, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel, weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. That's out of, actually out of Jeremiah. Here's an interesting thing. So throughout history, uh, people look at this scripture and say, you know, we've excavated Bethlehem and we've found no mass graves of children. And, and how could it, if something that horrible, why could Josephus not write about that? If it, well, let's just think about this for a bit. Number one, a city of 2,000 people, uh, how many children do you think would be two years and younger? 10? 15? 20? I said 20. Let me tell you, Herod would have that many people crucified in a day. And they never wrote about that at all. He would go in and annihilate cities and burn them to the ground, kill everybody in them, and they never talked about that as either. To, to lose 20 kids between the ages of two and under would not make a blip on the radar of King Herod's life, the violence that he would enact. It would not make a blip. wouldn't even make the headlines on the news. You know, there's, there's other things that just, um, th that's a silly argument to make. Most people wouldn't even talk about it. It just wouldn't even be a conversation they'd have. But it did fulfill scripture. And God used King Herod to fulfill that. Sometimes I can't understand. I can't understand it, God. Couldn't we have just left that one out? And yet, no, it's, it's in there. Because it was, it was part of the motivation to get Joseph into Egypt. So now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Okay, so now he's in Egypt, and the Lord speaks to him again. He's saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Okay, so in my timeline that I'm figuring out, they couldn't have been in Egypt maybe a year and a half, maybe two years. King Herod died within two years from the time that this would have occurred from the time that they left Egypt, um, if, if Jesus was born in, in zero, uh, okay, I'm getting mixed up, <laughs> B.C. or whatever it would be, he, Herod died in 4 B.C. 
We know that. It's documented. He died in 4 BC. So by this, the timeline, if you kind of look at it, they couldn't have been in Egypt more than a year and a half, two years at the most. And so they weren't there very long. And so they come back. And, and he says, those who sought his life are, are dead. So, so Herod is dead. Uh, verse 21, then he arose, he took the child and his mother, and he came to the land of Israel. And did they, they go right back to Bethlehem? Well, we started a new not life in Bethlehem. Maybe that's the place to go. But it says, verse 22, when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judah instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. Well, why would he be afraid of Herod's son? Well, Herod had many sons, but this guy here, Achilles, he actually had a, a thing that he wanted, he desired to punish all of his dad's enemies. And so he was, he was just punishing anybody who was against his dad, King Herod. He would go after them. He was just kind of cleaning the slate. Because he figured if they were enemies of my dad, they're enemies of me. And so that's what, what he was all about. And then, so Joseph, knowing that, he says, no, he turned aside and he went up into the region of the Galilee. So he goes back up north. This continues on. Because at that time, the region of the Galilee was under somebody else's rule. He wasn't under the, the Herod's. And it says, he came and he dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, that he should be called a Nazarene. Now, I got to thinking about this, too. Why would he go back to Nazareth? Do you think that showing up maybe four years later, Mary's had this little baby Jesus, and, and Joseph, they come back into their old hometown. Do you think everybody's forgotten? this child was born out of wedlock? Do you think everybody's forgotten that, that Mary got pregnant out of wedlock? No, I, th I think they, they would have suffered just as much ridicule, if not more, by coming back there. And yet, that's where they ended up. But that, it's, that it might be fulfilled that he would be called a Nazarene. Once again, the providence of God. It's just moving in people's lives, taking you places that you know you probably shouldn't go back to, but there you are, and, and you're bringing your family back with you. And, and you know, Nazareth wasn't a... Um, it wasn't good to be from Nazareth. Do you know that? It was a derogatory thing to be called a, a Nazarene to be from Nazareth. You know that? You know, it, it's, uh, um, you remember when, when Philip became a believer in Jesus? And Philip had a friend by the name of Nathaniel. And, and he went to Nathaniel one day and he says, he says come and, and see Jesus, meet the Messiah. And somehow Nathaniel knew that Jesus was from Nazareth. And you remember what he said? He said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's like when I tell people I'm from Wyoming, and they're like, can anything good come out of Wyoming? I've been through that southern half of Wyoming. There's nothing good there at all. And I keep telling them, I'm a little further north. Go a little further north. I'm, I'm from the good part of Wyoming. Where there's, there's mountains and trees and water. But you see, it was a derogatory thing to be called a Nazarene. You know, when, when people said Jesus of Nazareth, it wasn't Jesus of Nazareth. No, it was Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> right? How they do? No, it was derogatory. It was a degrading thing to, to be known as a Nazarene. And yet, God said, it's a fulfillment of my word that Jesus would be known as a Nazarene. And I'm like, Lord, I, I don't understand. And he says, I know. It's my providence. It's my thing. 
These are things that I want to fulfill in my son's life. You, do you see the providence in Jesus' life? Is he's just a baby? That all the fulfillment of scripture that would take place by the time he's four? It's amazing, folks. And sometimes you'll look in your life and wonder, how did I get here? And what's going on? I don't understand it at all. I'm with you. But you know Romans 8.26, right? God says he, he uses all things for the good to those who have been called according to my purposes, those who love me. You see, that's, that's it. That's what's going on. God is, if you love God, he's going to call you into doing things. Now, it, it says to those, to good for those, not for their good. There's a difference. Do you hear it? It's for God's good. His, to what God considers good. You know, a lot of, we're struggling today, aren't we? With our political thing that's going on and, and the, the, the pandemic thing that's going on. And I'll be honest, I don't see any good in any of that. Lord, I don't see what's going on. And he says, I know. I know you don't, Will, because my thoughts are, are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. But I do know this. I do know that whatever's going on out there, it's for the good of God. He's leading us down a path for his good. And what do we know that the goodness of God is? The goodness of God is Jesus Christ, and it's to lead people to salvation. I was talking with George this morning. He says, let us never forget, we're on the road to Armageddon. We're on the road to that final battle between good and evil. We're, on our, we're marching as good little soldiers for the Lord, right? towards that battle. But sometimes we get distracted and we think, no, that isn't good. My idea of good is, is roast beef dinner in my nice house and I get my way with politics and, I, and on and on and on. Well, that may not be God's ways. Somehow we've got to get to Revelations chapter 14 and on. Some, and, and if you, you know you who studied with us, um, there's some pretty bad things that are going to happen in our mind. But with the Lord, it's good because it leads us to Jesus and to his throne and to his reign and to eternal life with him. And so I just want to encourage you today, it, stay strong, stand, endure, and, and keep your mind set on, on things from above. Don't get distracted by what's going on here. And also realize that, that God may put you in places and situations that make you very uncomfortable and you feel like you're just overwhelmed. And I can't handle this. This is so out of my wheelhouse, God. This is so beyond my giftings. I think you got the wrong guy. I think you got the wrong gal. Maybe not. Maybe you're perfect for and God has put you there for his reasons. It's a providential moving of God in your life. And you may not see it at the time. It may seem like you're wandering around in Egypt. Or everybody's out to kill me. But just know, God, if you're a believer and you love the Lord, he is moving and working in your life for his good. Amen? All right. Now, Father, the worship team comes up. Lord, if we're not believers, if we're here today just out of curiosity of what goes on in this, or, or just, I just had nothing better to do today. God so loved us that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved just want to encourage you, you're not here by happenstance. God desires that you would be one of his and that you would have eternal life with him. For Jesus came to save his people, 
from their sins, his people, to those who would believe and trust in him. So what I would encourage you today, if you're listening out there in, in the internet world or here today, that you would put your trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the blood of Christ will cleanse you of all your unrighteousness and you will have eternal life with him. That you might trust and believe in him by faith today. I would encourage you to pray to God and to seek his righteousness for your life. Amen.
Have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. God bless you.